Um, I don't know, I've had some thoughts that I'll just start and see what the Lord does. But anyway, turn, if you will, to Psalm chapter 8. You know, sometimes it's appropriate to really deal with a big subject and really teach in that sense. Other times, I think God's people just need, need to be encouraged. And uh, somehow I feel like that's where we're, that's where we're at this morning. And uh, we need to, to really sense a lot of the things we've been singing about. Uh, how, much, how, how great the Lord's love is for us. That we're not, we're not here alone and we're not on our own. Praise God. But anyway, David is writing this. And he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. All flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Praise God, there's a, there's a lot of truth in this, obviously, and it's, it's kind of a jumping off point for, for the thoughts that I've had, but... David is obviously seeing the greatness of God, isn't he? He's seeing not only the greatness of the heavens, but he says, your glory is greater than that. And uh, his, his whole vision as he looks around the wonders of the universe is that how great this God must be. He's just, he's awesome. He's beyond our, you know, beyond imagining just how wonderful he is and how great and how grand. It's, it's amazing and it shouldn't be, I guess, if we understand uh, truth, if we understand uh, the progress of history, how blind so many are today. And, uh, you know, the, the people who consider themselves the most intelligent among our society could look at that and say it all happened. It's just, you know, nature is all there is, is their underlying belief system. And uh, so basically what you come down to is that nothing created everything. That's, that's what it boils down to. And their, uh, you know, as I've said before, they, their self-profession is essentially that we are all the accidental descendants of pond scum. But you know, what that does, among other things, is, is uh, well, it, it, it allows man to deify himself and imagine that he has the right to set all the rules, do as he please, make up the values as he goes along. Is that not where we're at? Yeah, our society has simply thrown away the rule book, thrown away divine law, any sense of what this society in particular was, was founded upon, was that there is a divine law, there is something to which we must conform if we're going to be blessed of God, and of course we have removed ourselves from that. But a lot of this belief system has everything to do with that. But you know what it does? It also removes every sense of purpose, every sense of meaning. If, if this is true, if their, if their belief is true, and they're so proud of their science and their facts, as they call them, then you are meaningless. Your existence is meaningless. It has no purpose, no value. When you stop breathing, that's the end of you and end of everything. And, you know, logically, why is there anything, why is there such a thing as right and wrong? Why is there any purpose? Why is your opinion better than mine? Why do we even have opinions? I mean, you can go on and on and on with the utter meaninglessness of life. We are mere accidents. But I'll tell you, God has revealed in his word and his, his, uh, his son and in the, in the very creation itself that he is a great God. He is a God who has a, a purpose that transcends everything. There is an order to everything. There is a place. Of, and yet, I mean, you sense David on the one hand. Haven't you felt this when you've gone out, looked at the stars, and you think, oh, my God, that is so great, so immense, and I'm so small. I'm so, and of course, the devil tacks on a, a little, another word besides small, it's, I'm so insignificant. And I guess in one sense you can look at it that way, but, that, but somehow in the plan and the purpose of God, 
everything has significance. There is no such thing as somebody who is insignificant. I mean, look at where David goes from the greatness of the creation itself down to, you know, what is man? I mean, in one sense, he's, he's just a marveling. God, you are so great. How in the world could you exalt us and, and think highly? How could you think of us at all? I mean, in the, you know, on earth, we're small in one sense, but I mean, you, t you think of the greatness of the universe, and, and David didn't have a clue compared to what we know today. I mean, it goes on and on to such incredible distances, the amount of stars and planets that must exist. And I'm certainly not endorsing the idea that, you know, there's all this stuff out there. But, but nonetheless, David, has, you know, saw enough to have this sense, God, I am so small. How in the world could you care about me? Anybody ever thought, felt that way? God, I'm just, Lord, how could you care about me? But yet, on the grand scheme, David sees humanity as created not just as an incidental where we're here another animal he's, he just wanted something to amuse himself we were created and given the rule over everything God had made what an amazing exalted position the human race was given and of course it you know our first parents threw it all away turned the whole mess over to Lucifer but nonetheless, when you look at what God's original intention was, it was to, it was to absolutely have a family of, of beings who were created in his image with eternal worth, with great value, the objects of his love and his care. Every one of them significant, everyone important to him who would also have the, enjoy, enjoy his uh, wonderful, beautiful creation. There was a relationship he desired. You see that right in the, in the garden as the Lord came. Here's the Lord himself who created everything. Comes down and actually wants to walk and talk with a bunch of mud. I mean, you know, it just gives you, it blows your mind when you try to, try to put it all together. But what a, I mean, we, you know, this is the way we need to think. We need to understand that God has this grand overarching purpose that, that even though sin has marred his creation, yet even now God is, is building, he's gathering out the family that he desired in the beginning. He is the one who has opened a door out of the mess that we made. So that everyone who surrenders to the, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and puts their hope in the, in the death that he died in our place can have, our, have the guilt of sin erased, can have its power broken through the resurrection, can be sons and daughters of the living God. Praise God. And we know that not only does he call people, he, he, he sets himself to work in every one of us. You know, we see the... Uh, the familiar scripture, for example, in, in uh, the 12th chapter of Hebrews, how we're to look to Jesus, who is not only the author, but also the finisher. So if you want to know where you got the ability to, to repent, where you had the, even the inclination to repent, where, the, where you got the ability to place your trust in him, you better look to the author. That's an ability that is given to you by God. When we, are, when we are willing to, lay, to, to surrender our wills to him, there is a divine influence upon our hearts that makes that possible. And by the way, it's only possible when he does work. Isn't that why the scripture tells us to you know, call on him when he may be found? Because there's going to come a time when it will be eternally too late. But I'll tell you what, God is calling and enabling people to put their trust in him, but he's not leaving them there, is he? He sets our life on a path, and it's not just a random path. Do you sometimes feel like your life is meaningless? Random, you just get up and you put one foot in front of another, and one day's like another, and it's just kind of, you know, what, what is it all about? I mean, it, living in this broken world, it's easy, even as a believer, to sometimes feel that way. To feel very small, very insignificant. But I'll tell you, there is a God who has set a path before every single one of us. It's unique to you. It's a road. It's a journey. Paul spoke of the, uh, of, of the course of his life. And you know, the language there really comes out of the Jewish priesthood, I believe. It's not just a race course, but there was, 
a, a very particular order of things in the activity of the priests in the worship of the temple. And priests just didn't go in there and, and just do their, do their own thing. Everyone had a place. They had a term of service. You are on duty from here to here. This is what you do. You shovel out this or you, you, know, you deal with that. You clean this or clean that. Everyone had an absolutely essential purpose to fulfill. And, and they, would, they would faithfully carry out their course until it was time to rotate out and somebody else would rotate in. But it's, a, it's just a simple picture of the fact that everyone mattered. Everyone had a place. Everyone had something that was laid out for them to do. And our lives are not meant to be meaningless. Our, our lives are meant to be lived under the, under the wonderful leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a, you have a purpose. You're, you matter to him. You know, many of you remember uh, in the convention, Brother Timothy gave that very simple little message. But it had some power behind it, didn't it? Because everybody refers back to it. He talked about having a purpose. Everyone, I mean, the, the simplest one among you, as we would rank people among, you know, in a human sort of way, I don't care who you are in the eyes of the world. If you're his, you have a purpose. And you matter to him. And we need to, we need to live our lives with a sense that, that everything is, is, is meaningful. And it's not just... It doesn't just have to do with this world, it has to do with eternity. Thank God. My God, if you're an atheistic evolutionist or, or what have you, what is it all about? What does it matter? What does it matter if people believe in creation? So what? You know, I mean, you think about logically. Nothing matters. Everything is just chemicals in motion. That's the end of it. Oh my God, there's a God who has made us and he made you for a reason. And he loves you. And he cares about the details of your life and mine. There is nothing that happens in our lives that's, that's not meaningful. And Jesus, as we began to say, is not only the author of our faith, but the finisher. He's the one who is at continually at work. And he's at work with a goal in mind. And that goal, as we know, in the grand sense, is to make us into the image. Into his own image. God is going to make us into the image of his son. We're going to be like him. And one day he's going to unveil his children before the world, before an unbelieving world, and say, this is what it's been about, folks. And we are going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. And you think there's going to be anybody that, that's insignificant on that day? I don't, you know, the devil will tell every one of us in, in a thousand and one ways, you don't matter, God doesn't care about you, God, you know, you're just sort of, God's forgotten about you. You, know, you think about the Old Testament prophecy that, where that exact point was, was addressed by Isaiah. This just comes back to my mind. I'll try to remember it. But anyway, you know, can a woman forget her suckling child? I've graven you on the palms of my hands. You know, how can I forget? I see you. Every time I look at my hands, I see what it cost me to rescue you from the pit of sin. How could I possibly forget? And I was thinking of, you know, as I was, I was thinking of this subject, like I say, we see the big picture so, to a certain degree. We know sort of where it came from, where it's going, but our place in it sometimes feels really, really, you know, I'm just part of the crowd. I'm lost in the shuffle. God, yeah, God's got millions of sons throughout the age. He's going to bring them all together. I'm just one of the crowd. I don't matter. Do you think, do you really think that's how God thinks of his children? I'll tell you, we see in the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus a very, very different way of relating to people than you will find in, in any earthly setting. I mean, you think of the people that he reached out to. Now, if, if we thought about it in a human way, I mean, we, we look at important people that are considered important in the world. How many of them really, really, really care about the poor, the downtrodden, the nobodies of the world? If they want their votes, suddenly they're a champion of everybody. Oh, I care about you. Vote for me. You know, I, was, I, I saw, I forget where I saw this, it, whether it was a headline or just, just somebody's comment. You know, you've got all these people, and, and I'll, I'll jump in, I'll just pass out a comment about an issue and it, without taking sides necessarily, but you know, there's all this 
kerfuffle going on about illegal immigration. The president basically won't enforce the law. Uh, but anyway, the, the comment had to do with a lot of these elite people who, who are so compassionate about that, but he says their compassion stops at the gated community. As long as the problem is out there somewhere, as long as we can dump them here, dump them there, dump, but don't bring them into my little privileged enclave here. You see the hypocrisy of human nature. And I'll tell you what, God doesn't think that way. He doesn't stay in a gated community. If he had been like a human, somebody important, he would have simply isolated himself from the hoi polloi, the common people. He would have huddled with a handful of you know, important people and just sort of sent them out to do all the dirty stuff. Did he do that? Boy, everything in his life modeled how he thought and how God who was in him thought about the poor, the downtrodden, the nobodies of the world. Didn't he say uh, through Paul that he's chosen the weak things of the world to shame the strong, the foolish things of the world, uh, to shame the wise, I don't remember the exact wording, but you, get, you remember the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and, and the, the ones who are nothing, I mean he goes right down to the bottom of the barrel, the ones who are nothing in the eyes of the world are going to be the ones who will bring to nothing the world itself. Because he's in them, because he loves them. And, and it doesn't say that he's just going to, I mean, he's, he uses the word chosen. What could be more important than to realize he has chosen me? Praise God. He just didn't throw it out there and I said, well, maybe, I'll, maybe he'll let me in, maybe, you know. He chose me. If there's ever been an inclination in you towards him, it's him reaching you. It's God who is pursuing you. The hound of heaven, as, as has been expressed in the past, is, is on our trail. Praise God. And he doesn't give up the trail. Thank God. Well, if you're feeling small this morning, you need to realize you're a son or daughter of the living God. You have every reason to lift up your head and not be discouraged, not, not think that you're worthless. Praise God. You know, we have so many reasons we feel that way. We, we look in the mirror and we see the faults that God has to bring to our attention to deliver us. But it, it has sometimes the devil jumps in and causes it to have the wrong effect. How could he love me? How could he love somebody who's as bad as I am? But Jesus didn't come into the world to save the righteous. He came to save sinners. Don't you think he knew what he was getting into? Don't you think he knows things about you and me that we don't even know yet? Didn't stop him a bit. That's the, oh, what a difference there is between divine love and what we call love. Praise God. Praise the Lord. But just think of some of the uh, examples we have in the life of Jesus uh, where he you know, the, I mean, the, how many times have we used these examples? But we need to think about these terms in a, in a personal way. You think of the woman at the well. She wasn't Jewish. She was a woman. And frankly, that wasn't a, the best place in society. That wasn't the most important place in society in that day. Thank God, you know, we get accused of being, of subjecting women and all of that. But I'll tell you, there is, a, there is an honor there is a place of honor for godly women that deserves respect and love and all of those things. They are not subject, subjugated in that sense. They are, they are elevated, but boy, in her society, they weren't. In so many places in the world, that's true today. But she wasn't even, you know, she didn't even occupy that place. It was below that. She was a fallen, immoral woman, captive to her lusts, an outcast in her own semi-heathen village. She couldn't even go out to the place of water, to the well. When all the other women went, she had to go alone. It was a shame that followed her. And here's Jesus, 
sent on a mission from heaven of love, primarily reaching out at that time to the Jewish people, though he, his heart was embracing the world and he saw what was coming. The mission at the time was to the Jewish nation. You know, a lot of times when people would travel from Judea to Galilee, Samaria was in between, they would literally cross the Jordan River, go up and then cross back to avoid Samaria. He went right through. And somehow in the providence of God, there he was, he sent his disciples into the village, we need some food, go buy it. And there he is. And there the woman comes, a divine appointment. And even she reacts, you know, who am I that you're talking to me? I don't get this. I don't understand why, why a Jewish man, at that point that's all she saw. Why would a Jewish man even talk to me, to somebody like me? And oh, what a glorious thing it is as it unfolds. And she realizes, she sees what she is. There's no sugarcoating. Isn't it amazing how God can convict without condemning? He can show us the ugliness of what we are and yet we can feel loved at the same time. Praise God. Only God can do that. Only God can, because it's not this sentimental, oh, I love you, and anyway, this is, I see what you are, but I, I love you, and my love has the power to change you forever, and to give you a sense of hope, and a sense of acceptance, a sense of, you're somebody, you're somebody, God, the God of the universe, who made all the stars out there, you're somebody that he cares about. He cares enough to send your creator to this well in the middle of a day, to meet with you and to open his heart and to reach out to you with the love of God. Do you get just a little picture of, of what our God is like? And you think of the, the woman who was taken in the act of adultery. I mean, there's so many, so many cases of women that, that he re interacted with and as I said, they were very much second-class citizens in, that, in the society of that day. So for him to, to give them a place of, of respect and honor and acceptance at all was unusual. You didn't have rabbis going around with a company of women to, that were loved and, and accepted. And of course, all the religious folks, man, they, they had it down pat. They knew what was what, and they knew what was, how things were supposed to be. And so they were all ready to, all ready to cast the stones. And Jesus, you know, they, they come to him and say, this woman was taken in the act of adultery. The law says she should be stoned. What do you say? Well, he didn't deny what the law said, did he? But what an awesome, the wisdom of God in his answer. Let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Well, I'll tell you, that, that wisdom ought to be widely used in our day. Lord have mercy, we have gotten to a one strike, you're out society. If you cross certain values that men have elevated to the highest height, and you just even say something that somebody might take offense at, in their view, my God, you are the worst of the worst. You're out, you're just you know, fired, you're whatever it is, you're disgraced. In the first place, being offended is a choice. I'd love to be in that situation and just say, you know, <laughs> something like, let's, let him who is without fault in this area, let's, hit the one that's never said anything offensive, never done anything that, you know, somebody else could condemn, you go ahead and, and make the first comment here. Go to a news conference. Let the, let the reporter who has never sinned Ask the, first, ask the next question. That'd be a quiet news conference, wouldn't it? What a hypocritical society we live in. But here's Jesus going to the other, the other extreme, showing God's heart. Folks, we need to realize the heart of the one who has called us. And never let the devil, never let our circumstances, never let anything control us, drag us down, discourage us. You matter to him.
more than you can possibly imagine. If this woman mattered to him, then everyone here, everyone here matters. Praise God. I mean, you can go on and on through the... What about Zacchaeus? All the, all the Sunday school kids know about Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. <laughs> a wee little man was he. Climbed up into a sycamore tree with the Lord he wanted to see. But you think about the context of that. The tax collectors were, were the scum of the world. I mean, the Romans ruled the world. They ruled that part of the world, and they hired people from among the Jews to be the tax collectors. So in the first place, they're collaborating with a hated enemy. In the second place, they were not shy about cheating the people and telling them, this is your tax and so much, only it really wasn't. It was a whole lot less. Guess what they got to do with the difference? And everybody knew it, but they couldn't. What could they do about it? They were under the thumb of Rome. The centurion would come around. And so, you know, they were popular people, weren't they? And this guy was diminutive. That means small. You know, I, I just had the thought this morning, I wonder if maybe he, that was part of his problem, that he felt so insignificant, he felt like if he could get a position like this, maybe it would, maybe he would feel some significance to his life, if he'd get a little bit of power over other people. You ever met people like that? They're bullies, and, and it really is, is not uh, that they feel superior, it's that they feel inferior. Think of the things that people do to try to make themselves significant. We don't have to do that. We can rest in his love and be who we are and, and have all the significance that this world can never give. And here's Jesus in a big crowd. A lot of important people probably there. But he comes under that sycamore tree and he looks up and calls for Zacchaeus. He wants him to come down. I'm coming to your house today. Jesus this righteous teacher, this miracle worker is going to, going to dinner with one of these people? They despised him, but Jesus loved him and opened his heart and brought him into the kingdom. Of course, one of his own, one of his own disciples, Matthew, was a tax collector. And you think of Mary Magdalene. and Scripture says, out of her went seven devils. You imagine she was a popular lady before that. Undoubtedly, immorality was part of it. I don't know, the Lord knows what else, but she was just a captive of Satan, despised, second class to begin with. But I mean, when you start falling into some of those kinds of conditions, she, they would have, you know, hiked their skirts and gone a different way, hiked their robes, I guess, gone a different direction. You remember how, the, you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? And that man that was robbed by thieves and the, the religious righteous people walked by on the other side, you know, just ignoring him. And then a Samaritan came along. I'll tell you, we have a God who has a different set of values in this world. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I can't remember where I was, but <laughs> so many different examples. But one in particular that that came to my mind, and I'm sure it's somebody, some of you have thought of it, is, you know, what about children? You remember the times when Jesus would come, and, and uh, one time in particular, that bunch of, bunch of ladies wanted uh, to bring their children to Jesus, to lay his hand and bless them? What was the reaction of the disciples? Get them out of here. This is, this is you know, this is not important. This doesn't matter. But Jesus stopped and said, Forbid him not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he stopped and blessed him. I've, I've experienced, I've tasted some of that, by the way, just being in, in villages on the other side of the world, and you have all the children crowd around, and sometimes their mothers will bring them up. I've, I've had services in all kinds of places, and afterwards the, the mothers will come up, and they'll want me to lay their hand on them and just pray for them, and... You know, you just bless them in the name of the Lord. And then sometimes they, uh, they'll bring their kids and their whole family. And they want you to put your hand on every one of their heads. But you think back to how Jesus reacted. 
You know, if you're young, if you're feeling small and unimportant in this world, Jesus loves you as much as he loves Paul the Apostle, as much as he loves anybody. There is a heart that is able to reach down to the smallest of the small. You know, another occasion, it was a, he set a child in the midst and said, unless you become like a little child, you won't even enter the kingdom. There's a humility that God values. He doesn't look for strong people. He doesn't look for important people. If you feel like you're important in, this, in the eyes of this world, he's got a job to get that out of you, to bring you to a place where you can just sit, have a humble spirit and say, Lord, I just, I'm, I'm nothing, but I'm everything because of, because of you. You get a sense of what David was feeling there, looking at that. What, God, this is just blowing my mind. I see how great you are. How in the world could you care about somebody like me? And yet, I'm part of a race. You've made a creation for us to rule over. Praise God. Of course, he said, for as such, as I said, is the kingdom of heaven. And it's not the will of your heavenly Father that even one of these little ones should perish. You think God is not concerned? You think about somebody who keeps track of the hairs in your head? And the ones that aren't there anymore? I'll tell you, that's a God who doesn't miss anything. We, we think, we, we impose so many human ideas on God. We imagine that he's just this great somebody who is so important, he just can't mess with the details and so we're just one of the one of the crowd the unimportant people he doesn't care about us I mean or he does in a broad sense but you know just leave the details to the to the lesser folks we serve a God who is so great that he can be completely aware of every atom in your body and in mine Everything in our spirits, everything about us, he is completely aware at all times. I mean, that just, that kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? Try to wrap your mind around that truth. But he is a spirit who inhabits eternity. There's no place you can go where he is not. Isn't that what David said? And was it Psalm 139? Where am I going to go? If I go to the uttermost part of the sea, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. And, and what did he say about the thoughts that you have toward me? If I, think about, if, if I think about the thoughts that you have toward me, they're more than the sand by the, they're more than the sand. You think about the grains of sand. And you think about every one of those grains representing some thought that the Lord has about you. Praise God. Praise God. You know, God is such a God of detail. You know, when he told Noah to build, a, to, to build an ark, he didn't just say, hey, Noah, I want you to build an ark and make it big enough for all these animals I'm going to send to you, and you figure out all the details. You see the sense of, of how God is so interested in every little thing? He didn't give Noah just this generalized plan. He's, he gave him exactly the dimensions, exactly how he was supposed to do it. You look at the tabernacle, you look at the temple, every little thing was prescribed, every little detail. They didn't have to guess. This is a God who is interested in the smallest of the small, the least important, as we imagine such things in this world. And I just, I don't know, you can go on and on, I guess, but here's, here's one of the, the one truth that, uh, well, let, let me express it a couple of ways. How, how, what kind of a father or a parents would it be who, say I had several children. Let's say, okay, let, let, let me just pick an example. Let me use Brian and April, since they've got a good sized family. <laughs> Let's bring it right down home here. They're, they're, they're out there and, you know, one of their kids turns up missing and he's, he's gone, you know. What would it be if they said, well, what's one kid, more or less? You know, human parents don't do that, do they? They care about everyone. 
do we imagine our Heavenly Father is, is less than a human parent in that respect? You think about the examples Jesus gave about the 90 and 9. The, nine, the 100 sheep that he had, 99 were there in the fold. They were in a safe place. What did he do? Did he say, oh, well, what's one sheep more or less? No. He left them and he went after the one. So if you feel like the one today, you feel, you feel like the one that, he, that needs some special help today, don't worry. Take heart from the, the simple truths that Jesus laid out. He left the 90 and 9 and he went until he found it. And he, he did whatever it took. He brought it back. You know, the woman who lost the coin. I mean, everywhere you see this, this attention to detail. You see Jesus pointing out a poor widow woman in the temple. You remember what was going on? All the rich people were casting their, out of their wealth, they were putting lots of money in the treasury at the temple. And this poor little widow woman puts in one or two little mites, I guess it was, some very small coins, hardly worth anything. And Jesus draws a special attention to this woman. He says, all those put out of their abundance, she put in all the living that she had. And Jesus singling her out has made her an example to every, I mean, that has millions and countless millions of people have learned of her life. You know, I'm, I'll tell you, it's going to be interesting in eternity to see God's values in action. Don't you suppose that there are people who are nobodies down here who will be highly lifted up on that day? There will be people that no one has ever, no one's ever heard them. They've never gotten up behind a pulpit. They've never made any kind of splash or gotten any attention, but they went into their closet. And they poured out their heart to God and they prayed and they, they were in tune with him. And it became a light. They became like him. Some of those people accomplished more in the kingdom of God than some of the big shots. There's nobody insignificant in the kingdom of God. Every one of us is called to be a light. Every one of us is called to be a vessel. Every one of us, the least among us, has the privilege of being so connected to him that his life flows into us and out of us and can be a blessing to other people. And you think of the body. <laughs> a lot of it you don't ever see. Good thing. But uh, I'm thinking of the inside now. But a lot of it... Um, you know, it's, you, you, never, you never see it, but what would happen if it just wasn't there? It'd be pretty rough. But you know, it isn't just like God has a family and he says, what's one kid more or less? We are so connected to him that we are a part of him. So it's not like what's one kid more or less, it's like what's one finger more or less. You are absolutely connected to him. The job that the father has given to his son will not be complete until every single member of the body of Christ has not only been called into the kingdom, but has been made into the image of his son and is ready to take their place in a brand new creation. All that was lost in the first one is going to be recovered and more. So I don't know who's here this morning that may be feeling some of this. I don't know why this came to, my, came to my mind and my heart. Whether there's somebody here or somebody in some other place that you feel really down, you feel really unimportant. You wonder if Jesus really is paying attention to the things that are going on in your life. You wonder if he cares. You just feel very small, very quiet, isn't it? Is this connecting with anybody at all? Yeah. We all experience that. I'm just wondering if there's a, is there a hymn book here? Yes. Praise God. Yeah, I'm not going to drag this out. There may be somebody else that can share something, but I thought of an old hymn. And I was all set to look it up on my tablet, and I didn't need to. It's in our hymn book. 
And it's Psalm, th uh, Psalm, it's Song Hymn 384. I used to sing this a lot. I don't, I don't remember if we've ever sung it here, but I certainly sung it growing up or heard it sung. And the name of the hymn is, Does Jesus Care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When for my deep grief I find no relief, though my tears flow all the night long? Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it aught to him? Does he see? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. You know, there's a lot of things that we experience on life's path that are not all pleasant. Jesus said it would be that way as part of the process of making us into, his, into the image of his son. What was the song we sang in the choir? Hallel uh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, I don't care what the devil's going to do. I thought that was pretty appropriate. But there's a lot of times we have to, we have to understand by faith we have to have such a conviction in here that holds us through those times because they will come. They come to every one of us. And the devil is going to pound in your head. You don't matter. You don't care. Jesus has forgotten you. Maybe you're not even his. And the, the list of the litany of stuff that comes out is endless. Or you're just, you're just one of the peons. You don't care. Somebody could be could see the light in you you might think you're nobody but somebody's watching the Lord can use you the least of you as you think of yourself as somebody who can who can move heaven in prayer somebody who could live in front of somebody in a way that they will see Christ in your life oh I'll tell you the smallest child that, is lo that, puts, that loves him, puts their trust in him. Well, what did Jesus say? They, they're angels in heaven. Behold the face of my Father. It's like that's the highest pinnacle. The very weakest and the most needy on earth is the, is the one that he reaches out for. The, and his heart just embraces the hardest and the strongest, the firmest. We don't always feel that. A lot of times we don't. But he wants us to know it. He wants to, us to know it in a way that will carry us through every one of those dark times and enable us to just rest in that love. Say, Lord, I know you love me. I thought about the time when, you know, Brother Thomas all of a sudden lost his little boy, Philip. And they called him and he had to go to the hospital or the morgue with one to identify the body. And you can imagine how what, his, what he was going through and the heartbreak that he felt in the inside, just a something just gripping but his prayer as he went was said oh Lord I know you love me boy that's, that's the conviction that we need in those times when the unexpected happens when life gets tough God I know you love me I know you love me I know, I'm, I, know I matter to you you're not doing this because you're mad you're, because I'm unimportant or you've forgotten or any, any of those things the devil would say you, I care about every single one of my children equally. We, we, we're the ones who do all this ranking. But, every, but God has the equal care for every single one of his children. So if you're feeling lonely and small this morning, wake up to the truth. God loves you. He cares about you. Praise God.